Ladies and gentlemen, salam alaikum. In this panel, we are going to look at leadership in the smart area, the smart era. The Minister of Higher Education and Scientific Research um, this morning asked the question, who would lead the changes? And we have on the stage here five experts who are going to speak for five minutes each on that particular topic. I will introduce them shortly. The question is, what do we actually mean by the smart era? For those of us involved in leadership, the SMART acronym has a very precise meaning in project management. It's about specific, measurable, attainable, realizable, and time-bound. But actually, for the SMART era that we are talking about, the definition, I think, has to be taken much wider than that. And for smart, we should think intelligent, advanced, and so on. But the question which our panelists are going to address is how does the smart bit actually change the skills needed to lead or the ways of leading in the smart era. The human factor, if you like, may be seen as remaining the same. Now, I'm going to introduce the speakers very briefly. They will come up one after the other, and I'm hoping that each of them will include one recommendation that we can put into the conference report. Our experts are, starting from your left, Dr. Ahmed Dea, who is the Deputy Minister of Education for Information Technology, Engineer Hoda Mansour, who is the Managing Director of SAP, Dr. Hossam Osman, who is the Vice President of the IT Development Agency, Professor Mohamed Lutfi, who is the Vice-Chancellor's Special Envoy of Coventry University, and more locally was formerly President of the Knowledge Hub. And finally, Professor Nadia Elaf Alraf, who is president of ESL, ESCA of the University of Egypt. I will not reintroduce the speakers. They will come up one after the other, or if they wish, they can speak from where they are seated. Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Professor David. Uh, thank you uh, for educating us, uh, uh, having me here with uh, uh, distinguished uh, guests and panelists. Um, and um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the leadership in the smart era. And let me, as being a deputy minister of uh, uh, Ministry of Education, uh, uh, I'm and my my agenda is full of ICT in the basic education. So let's define uh, what smart era and what the universities are coming to face in the next years that we are trying to prepare from early childhood spanning to the uh, grade 12. Uh, so uh, it's like a journey. It's a journey that started two years ago. It's a transformation where we decided to change the characteristics of the uh, Egyptian citizen. Uh, and uh, this is concerned about how they learn, 
how they uh, uh, live and how they adopt with the 21st century skills. So uh, we changed the curriculum in the early childhood part, which we are called Education 2.0. Um, put uh, uh, the minds of experts, uh, local experts, international experts, to adopt with the, a citizen that's capable of um, adopting with the market uh, in uh, 2030. So um, it's a long journey, and we added grade um, uh, KG1, KG2, and uh, first primary, second primary, and we're still adding a year by year into the ecosystem of changing the mindset of the students. In, uh, they can act uh, in the, the global uh, citizenship. And in the uh, high, high schools, grade 10, 11, and 12, we disrupted how to use the technology inside the education. So we started by connecting the schools. It's the simple one to have like a connected classroom concept where each classroom in all over the, uh, the schools have like an active panels connected to the, a data center availing content, uh, a content that's been available from different providers like Eureka, Britannica, Wolfram, uh, National Geographic Discovery, Education, and all this content are tailored for the Egyptian curriculum. And we distributed tablets for the, uh, the students We're, with a multifunction for those type of tablets. We have now 1.2 million students with tablets in hand using it to access content, to study using this uh, uh, type of technology. And imagine a, the poorest and the distant area uh, where a child, a student, have a tablet in his hand and have an accessibility to this massive type of content uh, and being able to uh, change his mindset of using how to use the technology. Uh, other than that, using that for assessment, we have a learning management system availing this type of content and the and assessment platform from Pearson uh, just to uh, change the idea of we measure the, um, the measure the level of understanding. We're not asking the students to memorize, just to understand and then memorize, to be able to search, learn, and read. So uh, those uh, students are coming into the university in the next two years. Uh, so I think the university should be start using this type of students that are capable of using the technology capable of consuming the knowledge in a different way that we used to be. They are not abide to a textbook. They are have a massive content available uh, all over uh, uh, his finger using the, uh, the tablet they have. So in, in, my, in my concern that leadership in the smart era, then the smart era is coming. It's, 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 we started this in uh, rooting that in the education, basic education system. So like it's like a challenge that we should be uh, having like a, a, a bridge between the higher education and the basic education in order to align the objectives of having the best leadership of adopting these mindsets and transforming that into a, 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 a fruitful uh, youth that are coming, pouring that into the uh, global markets. Indeed, um, for that transformation, the key word there, transformative leadership. Engineer Hoda. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I think it's much better. So thank you very much, uh, Professor David, for the introductions. And uh, thank you very much uh, for Dr. Ali for inviting me to be part of this uh, distinguished, very distinguished uh, panelists. Um, since I represent SAP, we have been focused uh, into bringing value and transforming the markets where we live and work uh, out of. Um, when we look at the Egyptian market and the transformation that is happening in the schools and the expectations of the students who have access now to tablets, even the uh, students who are coming from uh, a very underprivileged background, once they move into the universities, specifically that the universities in Egypt are mostly uh, with no or limited fees, 
the expectations of such students would be really big. So they will have a lot of option. They would have been educated on uh, different uh, platforms, on digital platforms, and then they will be looking for transforming this ex experience or taking their experience to the next level. So the expectations or what's being offered from the universities have to really cope with what the expectations of the students are. I was very pleased and honored in the morning session when we understood that the 22 of the Egyptian universities are now part of the global ranking. And having such technologies being integrated as part of the DNA or the daily work and uh, life of the students would be a must. Um, in SAP, uh, as uh, the colleague from ECS has mentioned, we have 97 out of the top 10 global uh, universities and research uh, institutes are using our technology. And what we can help with is either we can help transform the campuses into smart campuses, helping having intelligent universities, using intelligent technologies also to transform the way the student get the education, the different forms of education, and also focus on equipping the, those students with the skill set that will be required for the future. So if we look at the jobs for the future, these will be new jobs. Nowadays, for instance, we see a lot of demand for data scientists. This was never required in the past. Using intelligent technologies, whether artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, IoT, all of those technologies have not been a technologies of focus in the last 20 years. So things are being evolved and they are evolving. And I think the survival or the um, continuity would be to the institution that would give the best experience to the students. So equipping them with the um, uh, skill set, the soft skills, and equipping them with continuous learning platforms that would allow them to improve their uh, learning and get more of, of the best in class education to equip them for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So the emphasis there being on continuous learning, um, preparing leaders in a way that is continuous. And thank you very much indeed. Dr. Hossam. Should I have a presentation? Should I? If you wish. Sure. Okay. Okay. Does it say well? Did it? Okay, so uh, first, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank, of course, the organizers and uh, dear Professor Dr. Ali for the kind invitation to be here today. Uh, of course, we are all aware that uh, technologies are uh, disrupting education, putting the uh, regular uh, education system out of balance, uh, creating new value network creating new uh, business models, and we are talking about smart leaders. So smart leaders uh, need to be able to manage change, manage the required change, but the difficult part is that they need to manage a change while at the same time the ultimate target, the ultimate destination is not well defined. And this is what difficult about uh, smartness or smart university or digital transformation for university, that you need to be able to manage a change while the future is not very well defined and is not that uh, uh, clear with the KPI, with the targets uh, required. So uh, what I am going to present to you today in very few minutes and in a very fast, uh, because of the time limit, uh, that to be able to talk about the new position for universities that leaders need to manage, you have to define new capabilities for university. Like if I am talking about uh, what are the new capabilities for a smart university, I need to define them. And I need to be able to measure these new capabilities. So as you can see, 
we, the way we define a capability in terms of five dimensions that we need to manage service, process, people, information systems, and technology. And of course, my, my, I will focus more on people, but what I'm trying to say is a smart university has well-defined capabilities in certain areas. And each capability, to be able to realize it, you need to have data in five dimensions, starting from service and ending by uh, technology. I'm, I'm, I'm going fast because of the time limit. What I need to do is we created within the Software Engineering Competence Center what we call a landscape for a smart university. What's a smart university and how to define it? So we have a landscape for a smart university. Within the landscape, we define what's called smart capabilities. And within the smart capabilities, as you can see, we have six segment. We have something called smart learning, smart assessment, smart operation, smart support, smart campus, and smart classroom. And for a university to be smart, we are defining clear criteria how these capabilities need to be realized, how each of them should be realized in terms of another subset of capabilities. So what, what we are trying to do here, we are trying to define the ultimate position of a smart university in the future and how to keep improving and enhancing this position because it's not really a one phase, it's an ongoing process. All the, it's like digital transformation or being a smart university is not a project that will end. It's an ongoing activity that will always need to work on. So to define it in the future, again, you have to be visionary and see the capabilities that are needed. So each of these capabilities need to be realized. And one dimension to realize it, we are talking about, as I mentioned, we are talking about people. These are the six capabilities and how they are defined. And we did this in comparison to what's happening in different universities worldwide and what are the different models to do it. What we need from leaders to understand the future position that we are after, to understand the capabilities needed and the capacity building activity needed for leaders to realize these, these capabilities. I'm just giving you a sample uh, definition for what's smart support, what's smart support within a university. We are talking about like uh, uh, disability support, technology transfer, international relation, medical support, data analytics support in a university, and so on. And I'm talking about how to realize each of these capabilities in terms of technologies. And of course, before that, as we mentioned, in terms of leadership or people to manage such a change. These are again so sample capabilities that we are configuring. Of course, because of the time limit, I cannot take much time describing each of these. But the ultimate point is, If I need to have universities working in the future, I need to build a business capability defining smartness in five dimensions. And please remember that digital transformation is about transforming organizations. It's about transforming individuals as well. You have to transform individuals. So I cannot be a leader to transform education and university unless I myself is digitally transformed. And what this means that I have to be, uh, I have, uh, I must have basic business insights of what are the utilizations of the different technologies and how to take advantage of. 
I remember uh, like uh, one, one, I think, GE, I think General Electric CEO, once mentioned that if the rate of change outside is more than the rate of change inside, the end is in sight, that you need to cope with the change. So how I am as a leader of a university, how can I cope with the technology development? Should I be an expert? The answer is no, I should not be an expert. What I need to be, I need to have business insights on the utilization of technology to be able to understand how to build the capabilities of universities in the future. I'm very much like, of course, again, as I mentioned, time will not allow me to talk more about the, the, the model and the, uh, the, uh, the full detailed map for smart university in the future, but we are willing very much to discuss with different uh, people interested how to really work on the five dimensions, including leadership and people, to transform universities into a smart university. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Hassama. I think you brought out very clearly a couple of points there. And that is, does SMART apply to the process? Or does SMART apply to the output? And the other fascinating part, we're, we're talking about leadership in the SMART era. Your point that leaders actually don't need to be experts, they just need to be enablers. So I think you've given us a couple of very clear pointers there. Thank you very much. And now, Professor Lutfi. Well, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'll, I'll also use the, uh, my PowerPoints to, to illustrate what I want to uh, uh, talk about today and how. Um, I'll try to answer the main question that David on, asked at the beginning, which is how will smart, how will we, uh, what are the skills needed for, uh, for having uh, smart universities by leaders? So what is, the, from a leader's perspective, what is needed in, uh, for them to be uh, leaders of smart universities. The first answer that came to my mind is that, is there different leadership for a smart uh, university from leadership to a university? Or is leadership is leadership, encouraging people, uh, leading from the front or leading from the back? But that's a, a question I'm asking myself. The, that's what I call the university uh, life tree. So any university in the world starts with its values. The values and the strategies, they, they, are, they are the culture of the university. From this, we get a structure, and the structure determines the behavior of the university. Any leader across the world would need to, be, to identify the values of the university, to work with his staff to clarify the values that they, they aim for, which would lead to them developing their strategies and then the structure that will determine their behavior, which is their performance. Any university across the world, there are several sets of values. There are the fundamental values of a university, which is university autonomy, academic freedom, and uh, other values also that are, that are uh, fundamental, which is like integrity and fairness and equity. But w why are we going down to that depth? Be you can't really, talk about, as, as uh, my colleague mentioned, um, uh, or in the previous session, somebody mentioned that there is need for innovation and creativity. So innovation and creativity are a function for university autonomy and academic freedom. If you don't believe, or if the university is not built on to be autonomous, to be free, the academics are free, free with limitations, of course, then this would not lead or create the culture inside the institution to allow for university, for creativity and innovation. If you look at any institutional values, creativity, innovation, excellence, they're all functions as well or, or needed for the fourth industrial revolution or what is needed, what we're calling a smart university. But creativity and, and innovation are values that universities would consider them as, as institutional values, but they're functions of the fundamental values of any university across the world. So what do we need from leaders in this new era? We actually need everything that is on the right-hand side. 
We need the leaders to be creative, to think laterally instead of vertically, to be non-linear, holistic, dynamic, and systemic. And what does this mean? We need, we, we, um, the changes, as my colleagues mentioned, around us are very fast. The fourth industrial revolution is very fast. Uh, Engineer Hoda mentioned that, uh, that there is a need for change and it's how can you change this. Also, Dr. Hossam mentioned it's disruptive technologies that is around us. So as leaders of the university, the change around us is very fast. And maybe doing the same thing as we used to do it before is not the right way forward. We have to rethink things. If you think the, the best example about vertical and lateral thinking is the example of the of the Newtonian physics, trying to analyze the proton and uh, moving across around the nucleus. It, it was the way that they were thinking about things, but it didn't work until Niel Bohr came up from, he's a Dutch scientist, 34 years old, said, let's throw all the Newtonian physics away and let's think of a new way, which is the quantum physics. And this is what analyzed, was, uh, helped us understand how does this work. Maybe in higher education, the way we lead higher education, maybe we need to think uh, 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 laterally instead of vertically, because the challenges are so fast for us to use the same structures, the same way of thinking to uh, understand them. That's not mine. Okay, let's talk about the, the, the top emerging jobs, and I'm actually following from Engineer Hoda's, uh, Hoda's uh, talk about, about what is the new jobs that are there. So if you look at the top 15 emerging jobs in the UK, their data, their robotics, their say, they are uh, cloud, their cyber security. This is what we need to equip our students. So as leaders, what do we need to do to take this forward? It's how can we think differently to be able to address the challenges around us. And the challenges around us are so fast, they're moving so fast, new jobs are emerging, and we need and if you look at anything like uh, anything like robotics, for example, we're, we're saying now that everything will be by drones, by robots. They need their own ecosystem, ecosystem to support them. Even going down the links with humanities, like you need uh, robo robotics and ethics and robotics. How are you going to handle this? So it's all about looking at the ecosystem that needs to support the technology. And the most important thing that I'm trying to emphasize is that jobs in the past or, or the universities and programs in the university were about professions, were about uh, creating professions. The new design of programs need to be technology-led because it's all about technology. Everything is about robotics, everything is, is about uh, uh, cryptocurrency. So they need to be technology-led, not profession-led. And the important thing that I'm trying to emphasize here is there is a great difference between doing things right and doing the right thing. You could be teaching the students, which is doing the right thing, but you're not doing things right, which is looking at the bigger picture. And that's the difference between strategic thinking and tactical thinking. If we look at the holistic view, and I mentioned in the past holistic view of a university, so this is how we should think about things. We shouldn't think about creating more universities. We'll have graduates, which is better for the economy, better for the investment. But as leaders, we need to think about how can we link our graduates with what is needed outside, and this is doing the right thing, thinking holistically about what's happening. More graduates for just the sake of graduating students. You can see the level of employability, for example, in Egypt, in graduates from law, in graduates from, uh, from, the, from uh, pharmacy. So it's about mainly thinking about linking ourselves to the, the strategic thinking of the country, and it's doing the right thing. Again, it's the tree of life for a university. Everything starts with your values. And your values, they determine the culture inside the university, which would allow you to innovate and be creative. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Professor Lutfi. Thank you for that very powerful image of the tree and how things happen through the tree and reminding us that values are at our core, but also leaders, the task of leadership is to take those values through to behavior, which is appropriate for the smart era. Our last presenter is uh, Professor Nadia.
First of all, I would like to extend my warm appreciation to uh, Professor Adi Shams for inviting me to speak in this, in the fifth Educate event. Uh, I'm much honored to be in the presence of Professor David Luck, one of the uh, most renowned experts in the field of higher education. It's, a, it's really an honor, Professor Luck, and my fellow panelists. Uh, it's very difficult to, to speak after so many experts have already expressed their points of views and have already uh, shared with us their insights regarding higher education. But I will try to sum up what um, I've been thinking about since I've been invited to speak about universities and the digital ecosystem, which is what's surrounding us today. Uh, actually, all universities or the whole educational uh, system is facing the, a knowledge paradox. We are, at this point of time, this is what we are facing. We are facing uh, uh, the knowledge economy. We are part of the knowledge economy. And we are facing so many challenging questions, like do we need to reinvent education? This is a very important question. Uh, another question is education faith, facing a death valley, which is a very critical thing. And what will happen if we do not change? Where will the universities be 30 years from now? The future jobs require uh, three variables. They require STEM education, which is science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. They require creativity to a great extent, in addition to emotional intelligence. Uh, very simply, if you get engineers or if you get doctors and you add to them the emotional intelligence, they become the best uh, managers, the best business people in the whole world. Uh, so what are universities' responsibilities? So responsibilities is to give generations of future employers the right education employees the right education to help them cope with the digital workforce. Uh, not only knowledge. We don't want just to provide knowledge because now knowledge is available. There are so many uh, informal ways of getting knowledge. So universities have a much bigger responsibility. If we go back and take a look at the triple helix model, we'll notice that the three stakeholder groups, it's universities on one side, governments as regulatory bodies on the other side, and then uh, industries and the business community on the third. There has to be some sort of integration between the three perspectives of the triple helix stakeholder groups. What will happen in the future, future jobs? It is expected that by 2030, the job market will differ radically. Almost three to four percent of all the jobs uh, of the workforce that the job that the people are performing jobs now, they will have to ha do some transformation and change in their occupational capacity. Eighty-five percent of the jobs that today's learners will be doing haven't been invented yet, and I think this was uh, yeah, expressed in the previous presentations. So many jobs will disappear. We as universities, we are getting students uh, ready for the job market for jobs that definitely will not exist in a few years' time. And this represents a very controversial issue for all universities. Uh, so the question is, can technology help universities in bridging the gap? I believe, and after hearing all the experts today and doing some reading over the past period, and I believe that uh, actually universities will be in a be much better position if they implement technology, not just technology as technology, but the ability to use technology, because technology's aim is to satisfy human needs. We don't just want technology to say we have tablets or we have this or we have that. We have every piece of technology has to be used to satisfy a human need. So what will happen to learning? Learning is going to become more interactive and uh, learning is going to become by doing, not just by listening. 
to theories and concepts. Learning will be more creative because we are going to invest in creating a student body that wants really to make a difference, not just to be imitators. Learning will be very flexible. The way students are learning now, learners are so different than the older generations. And we are going, uh, technology will help us to increase student engagement, which is a critical factor when there are so many distractions in today's world. So let's look at what the students are using now. That's, these are our students. They're not the regular traditional type of students we've been dealing with over the past years, you know. We have students who are all the time using mobile devices, smart boards, tablets. The concept of flipped classroom is so attractive to many students. The open learning platforms, uh, the informal learning, as was mentioned before, we are competing now with ways of gaining knowledge that we are not, I believe, as universities prepared to handle in the way it should be done. And maybe this is the essence of this conference or these panels. So what are we facing as a challenge? We are facing informal education, informal knowledge. The MOOCs platform that uh, we heard about from Engineer Yusuf in the past channel, Coursera, the Khan Academy. What are the advantages? This is what the people, the learners want. They want uh, to have flexibility. They want to study at their own pace. They want individualized learning. I mean, we at universities, we are always focused on testing. Out of my so many years, I don't want to tell you how many in the educational system, but we are always focused on testing. But in the current world, actually, testing should not be the goal. Testing should be just a diagnostic tool to help us to diagnose where are the areas of weaknesses that we need to invest in. Because when you look at it, informal learning gives the learners this kind of option where they can learn at their own pace. They select the areas that they feel they lack or the job market needs and they develop their profiles. And this is what we as university leaders from the top level in the university to the least level, we have to think about it. This is it. And actually what we have been discussing today over the past two panels uh, is, has been summed up in the Bologna process because we at Eslaska University, we follow the Bologna process and the ECT system. And they just summed up the digital challenges of 2020 that should be handled by everybody in the Bologna process. So if you look at those seven items that will be addressed by all universities during the coming period, it is we are facing diversity of students. So we have to take the social dimension into consideration. Uh, the digital learning, because outside formal programs, so many informal knowledge sources are now available and accessible and at no cost to the learners, okay? The third one is uh, teaching and learning has become, has changed. Peer learning, flipped classrooms, open platforms. The fifth challenge is a very serious challenge that I'm sure Professor Locke has been considering is, are we at universities going to uh, recognize informal education? Are we going to create a system where the informal progress through informal platforms of education will be transferred to formal programs? This is a very critical issue that we at universities, we have to consider, and the regulatory bodies also have to consider because governments and the regulatory bodies are playing a major role in developing and implementing technology into education. And definitely, the last, the last concern, it's not the least, it is the quality assurance. Quality assurance because the open platforms, anybody can <coughs> upload anything on open platforms. The issue is, how are we going to guarantee quality education? All of these issues have been just we have discussed, many of us have mentioned today, they have been circulating for some time. 
And we are facing now Generation Z. It's not X. This is a typing error. The, this is the generation. This is the profile of the students we are dealing with. These are their tools, mobiles, Google Maps. I mean, I don't think any one of us, the parents especially, has ever been in a position during the past five or six years where someone came to ask him a question because he needs an answer. When, when anyone wants a question or wants to ask something, they either go to Google Scholar or they ask Siri, my granddaughter who's eight years old, she asks Siri for all the questions instead of asking her mom. These are developments. People, have, they're talking about FinTech, WebMed, Bitcoin. This is the language, LinkedIn. Uh, this is different, the Z, the Z generation that was born in 1995 are now in their mid-20s, approaching their 30s, they're so different. We, the university body, we have to understand that they are so different. And uh, what we have to, I think, as the final point is we don't want to, to look at students and say that, uh, this is a student at risk because his grades are low, he's not performing well, he is not attending on a regular basis. This is the traditional definition of a student at risk. But actually, I believe after doing some reading and out of my personal experience, uh, that a student at risk is someone who is not prepared for uh, the digital workforce. This is the student at risk. And we always have to remember that, as we always say in the business world, that there is a return on investment. There is also a return on education. And this is what the students, the learners, are always evaluating, the return on education. What is the final challenge, the most critical challenge? It is that you have to change mindsets, we are facing resistance to change. But we at Esleska, I'll give you a bright example, although there is the triple helix, there is the regulatory body, we have, there is flexibility in the regulatory body. We have succeeded in introducing a bachelor program, a three-year bachelor program using the ECT system. So it means though the mindsets are set, in a certain way, yet there is a tendency to be flexible. There is a tendency to cope with the requirements of today's uh, competitive uh, business world. Thank you very much for your... Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I would like to give my panelists notice that at the end of these few remarks, I shall be asking them each to give one recommendation to Egypt about how leadership for the smart era can best be developed in Egypt. So there is your homework while I just make a few remarks. What have we learnt from this? Well, traditionally, leadership is seen as taking an organization from one point to another. And there's an implicit assumption in that that you know where the other point is. But one of the features of the fourth industrial revolution is actually, it is much more difficult to work out where that point is. And hence, I think one of the challenges for leadership in the smart era is to be able to look much more at process and how technology can be used in processes to take organizations forward. Next, no one leader is going to be able to do all of this on his or her own. And hence, 
it seems to me that it is more responsible or more essential for us as leaders to develop capacity in those around us. And that includes the capability of the technology and how it can be used much effective, more effectively. But then things are changing more quickly and more unpredictably. And I think that means that we need to be more flexible as leaders in the way that we approach things. But from Professor Lutfi, whilst we're going to need to be more flexible, we must stick to our values because like the tree, they are one of our anchors in this period of change. I liked very much the mention of the Bologna process in the last presentation because our universities increasingly need to work more together and that means that we need to have systems in place that will be trusted by others. And finally, if there is a branch of leadership which becomes more important in this smart era, <clears throat> it is the leadership of change. And maybe what we should be doing is focusing much more of our leadership training on the leadership of change. Those are my few remarks, but I want now to go along the line and just ask each of my panelists to give one recommendation to Egypt about how to improve leadership in the smart era. And literally, please, just one sentence. Okay, I put this in Arabic, uh, please, David. Okay. Uh, uh, طبعا انا بنبقى دايما محتارين كلمه سمارت دي هل يا ترى بيها تكنولوجي ولا هل يا ترى سمارت دي تعني ايه دايما في خوف من التكنولوجيا أه ساعه لو فكرنا ان التكنولوجيا تبقى لازم تبقى في الجامعه فده بيبقى خيار صعب ان احنا بنحط برينجينج الاليفنت انتو ذا روم يعني انما عمليه التحول بتبقى بتعتمد على البني ادم في الاول في الاخر في الاول وفي الاخر هو الكورنر ستون لاي عمليه تحويل وبالتالي لو كانت النصيحه او يعني اللي احنا نقدر او الريمارك اللي نقدر نقولها نعمل ايه لمصر عشان خاطر يبقى في ليدر شيب في السمارت ايرا ان انا نركز على الاهداف ويبقى في كولابريشن في تعاون ما بين الستيك هولدرز من الايكو سيستم العمليه التعليميه سواء في التعليم ما قبل الجامعي سواء في الجامعات اولياء الامور لازم تبقى الاهداف واضحه وكوميونيكيتد ان احنا عايزين المنتج بتاعنا يوصل للنوع ده من الاحترافيه او من الجوده وبالتالي احنا كايكو سيستم في عمليه تقديم خدمه التعليم نبقى عندنا السمارت واي ان احنا نوصل للاهداف دي. Thank you very much indeed. Engineer Hoda. Yeah, actually, with the point that I've written down was related to change. So change will happen. It's inevitable that change will impact jobs, and the survival will be for the for the leaders who will adopt change and who would motivate also their teams to change internally to be relevant. So if we become less relevant, there are a lot of competition out in the market. If I'm looking, for instance, at universities. Specifically, we have so many universities in Egypt or abroad, and now the students being very well educated, coming up from the um, uh, schools, having access to the level of technologies that is being made available to them now by the government, they will be more aware. So you need to be relevant, you need to adopt change, and you need to change very, very fast, and technology will help you with that. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. Hossam? Yeah, like the main message I, I like to convey that uh, transformation is about taking a new position in the future. Uh, we cannot really work in an ad hoc way. When you say a new, new position, you need to define it in terms of 
very clear capabilities for the future. What we are doing that we are defining a reference architecture for capabilities for smart leaders and smart universities in general. And we like very much to work with the different stakeholders to apply such an architecture, taking into consideration the localized parameters and the special status of Egypt. Thank you very much. Professor Lutfi? Thank you. Um, creativity and innovation are the pillars of the fourth industrial revolution, in my view. Uh, university leaders would need to create the culture in the institution for these two to flourish. This culture starts from university autonomy, from academic freedom, from creating a culture within the institution of trust that would allow students to be more innovative and more creative. And it's the culture of dissent, giving them the opportunity to argue, to ask why science is done this way. Thank you. And finally, Professor Nadia. Thank you, Professor Locke. Thank you for the, for the very investigative types of questions that is, is going to leave us thinking more than when we came at the very beginning, thanks to my fellow panelists for their insights. I think what we need to do, from my point of view, that we need to have um, a continuous renovation of the internal structure of universities and the mindsets of everybody involved in universities at different levels, in addition to the importance of aligning the expectations between universities and the government and uh, the business uh, communities and the industry uh, overall. Uh, if we don't succeed to do this or to create this kind of formula, I think that the challenge will continue for some time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I indicated at the start that we had a panel of experts, and I think they have certainly demonstrated that in what they have shared with us very efficiently. And so could I thank them, and could I prof thank Professor Alishan Zeldin for putting all of this together. Let's join up together in thanking them.